Well, good morning. It's nine o'clock in California. Um, this is the California Avocado Society, University of California Cooperative Extension, California Avocado Commission um, bi-monthly seminar on avocados. Um, we're talking hot times in the old avocado orchard tonight or this morning. And we are going to be hearing from uh, the experiences of people from around the world, from Israel, Spain, Chile, uh, Australia, and right here in California. Um, so we're gonna be hopefully learning from others' uh, mistakes and, and successes. Uh, so th this is a program that's being sponsored by um, Calabo, Westpac, Index Fresh, Mission, Westphalia Fruit, Brokaw Nursery, Delray Avocado, American Ag Credit, Agri-Service, Nutrien, Farm Credit West, and McDaniel Fruit Company. And I'd like to highlight, um, last year we did two sessions on um, heat mitigation. Um, both of those sessions are available at the California Avocado Society uh, website. Um, you go in and click on webinars uh, from the past and you'll, and you'll see it. And, you, and you'll get some really good general background on the physiology of heat, what it does to the tree, how, how, how uh, heat can be manipulated in various fashions. Um, today we're going to hear even more specific uh, recommendations. And I'd also like to announce um, if you don't know already that the World Avocado Congress is going to be held in New Zealand in April of 2023. And they've got a, a, a registration that goes up, that's available now. And if you sign up now, it's like 600 US dollars. If you wait until August, it's gonna be 800 or something like that. And if you wait until <clears throat> later on, it's gonna be 1200. So uh, it might be worth uh, registering now. So with that, um, uh, our first speaker is Arnon Dog. Arnon is a uh, senior scientist at the Volcani Center in, in Israel, which is the preeminent research center in, in Israel. He's been working on fruit tree cultivation and physiology, especially on olives, avocado, pomegranate, table grapes, and jojoba. Um, and he just told me some, some interesting stories about uh, the effect of potassium on uh, uh, avocado nectar and its effect on bees. He was actually the, the Israeli, Israeli state bee specialist um, for 10 or 12 years. And I hope we can bring him back to talk about avocados and pollination and pollinators. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Arnon Dog from Israel. Take it away, Arnon. Okay, hello everybody. And uh, thank you, Ben, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to present our uh, result. Uh, actually, we thought that heat wave is the only local problem in, uh, in Israel. It's not something uh, global in, in, in avocado. And due to your invitation, I understood that it's uh, something more uh, global. Uh, I performed this uh, study together with uh, my collaborator from uh, Vulcani, with Elite, Elena and Victor, with Guy Reshef from uh, Netafim Company, Elise Simansky from uh, Nevatim, and Daphna Ziv from the Extension Service of the Minister of uh, Agriculture. Um, so uh, background, uh, spring heat wave caused substantial fruit abscission in avocado in Israel, especially immediately after the flowering we have very uh, severe heat wave of wind coming from the desert, uh, prevalent during uh, uh, end of April and May. And this is very sensitive uh, uh, physiological stage and the fruitlet that exposed to those heat waves many times tend to uh, abscess. Uh, in half, around half of the interannual variance in yield was uh, explained by spring heat wave. And uh, the prevalence of those heat waves with the global climate change uh, uh, increase. The, the, uh, the number of those heat waves and their severity. So it became uh, an important uh, topic in respect to productivity of uh, avocado in Israel. 
Therefore, the objective of this study was to evaluate the use of irrigation system for overhead canopy cooling in avocado orchard in Israel. In it. Uh, we can see here example for the heat wave damages that we can see. In the left side, we can see uh, burning of a uh, young fruitlet. Um, later on, we can see uh, branch burning, uh, inflorescence drying, and a fruitlet dropping, which we found like a carpet below the tree after those heat waves. Uh, in this experiment that I uh, will describe, we tested the two orchards. Okay, fresh water to cool the tree, and uh, desalinized water with the EC of uh, 0.38 that is Siemens per meter. The other uh, orchard. And automated activation of the cooling system were set to air temperature above 33 degrees Celsius and relative humidity of below 40 degrees Celsius. That was in 2020. And most of the results I will present are from this year. Uh, later on, we decided to adjust the value and increase the temperature threshold for 36 degrees Celsius and relative uh, humidity. Uh, for below uh, 30%. Uh, we believe that uh, this is uh, the real threshold for uh, damage in, in avocado, at least in our uh, condition, if you're speaking about damage of uh, heat waves. And we try to minimize <clears throat> the time that we apply uh, water on the canopy to reduce uh, accumulation of uh, salt. So in uh, 2021 and 2022, this year, we use those uh, uh, new uh, thresholds. Those are the spray and sprinklers we are uh, using. Uh, <clears throat> those ones are produced by a Netafim company. Uh, the one in the left is uh, we need to install it on every tree. And the one in the middle, in the right side, we can uh, uh, place them on every second tree and they cover, uh, 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 and they cover all the area. Uh, you can see different uh, uh, level of uh, water application, 21 cubic meter per hectare per hour, 17 cubic meter per hectare, and 31 cubic meter per hectare. And again, <clears throat> we are looking for the amount of water, minimal amount of water that will uh, provide us the cooling that we are looking for. Uh, in the year of uh, 2020, we uh, face very severe heat wave. And you can see in both orchard uh, that the temperature every uh, day reach around 42, even uh, 43 degrees Celsius. While the humidity went down to below 10% uh, relative humidity in uh, both orchard. And in the gray uh, bars, you can see the um, time interval that the system was operated. When we uh, pass the threshold, the system, the cooling uh, system uh, operated. Uh, so you can see uh, several days, one after the other, in which we operate the system. It's not typical uh, situation in Israel. It was very severe uh, heat uh, event, which uh, require us to uh, operate the system every, every day. <clears throat> we took... Uh, a uh, photograph with the uh, thermal uh, uh, imaging uh, of the plot that we spray. So you can see uh, M, the squares with M was the treatment of uh, sprayers of 21 meter per hectare. The uh, squares with the P were um, uh, sprinklers in uh, pulses with 70 meter uh, cubic meter per hour. And those with uh, Z are sprinklers of uh, 31 a cubic meter per uh, hectare per uh, hour. So you can see very nice uh, the uh, impact of uh, the cooling impact of the uh, treatment. 
and the differences in uh, temperature is around uh, uh, in this uh, way of uh, measuring it, it's around 10 uh, degrees Celsius between the canopy that was cool, the one that you see here in, uh, in shadow, and the other part of the orchard, it's the difference are around uh, uh, um, 10 degrees Celsius. We reduce the temperature from around 40 degrees Celsius to around uh, 30 degrees Celsius. And we believe that it makes uh, the change in respect to the uh, performance of the tree. And we need to remember also that uh, we reduce the temperature and of course we increase uh, humidity. So the VPD uh, reduced dramatically. So the heat stress of the tree uh, reduced dramatically. We also measure the temperature of the leaf uh, inside the canopy, not in the upper part with the thermocouples. And here you can see that the differences were a little bit uh, smaller of around five uh, uh, degrees Celsius between the area, uh, between leaves that were uh, cold to those leaves that were not uh, uh, cold using the evaporating uh, cooling. Uh, we mentioned the issue of uh, water quality. So here we can see pictures of uh, the orchard that was, uh, we use brackish water of 1.1 DC Simmons per meter. You can see in picture A, you can see those uh, area which cover with the white color. This is accumulation of salt after a week of application of the water. And here in B, you can see it's from closer look. So you can see the uh, leaf with the whitish uh, color and you can see the new growth that replace the damaged uh, 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 leaves. Uh, in C, you can see the leaf from a uh, closer look. We can see the white color of accumulation of salt and in these with stereo microscope, we can see the crystals of the salt that were accumulated on the leaves. They are attached to the trichoma on the, on the leaves. Uh, so we try to uh, measure the accumulation of salt on the leaves. In the left side, we can see uh, the tree that were cooled with uh, brackish water. And in the right side, we can see the tree that were uh, cooled with uh, uh, fresh water. So we can see significant accumulation of uh, sodium and we can see significant accumulation of uh, chlorine. We need to remember that chlorine generally, if we're speaking about threshold for damage, we speak about uh, 0.2%. Uh, so the application of uh, water uh, uh, reach or led to a uh, level that is higher than the threshold for damage. So uh, it's probably caused the damage as we have seen in the eyes. We do not see this problem with the fresh water. We see some accumulation of uh, salt, but still the level are very, very low. We thought that uh, uh, calcium is also part of the mineral that accumulate on the leaves, but we didn't see accumulation of uh, calcium. So probably most of the crystal that we see on the leaves and the damages are due to accumulation of uh, sodium and, and uh, chlorine. And again, when we apply uh, brackish water for several days, one, one after the other, we can see damage for the leaf, on the leaf. We do not see those damage with fresh water. So one of our uh, conclusion was to apply the water if we use brackish water for only limited period, not more than two weeks or three weeks. After that, we need to <coughs> allow the new growth to recover and uh, replace the uh, damaged uh, uh, leaves. Uh, we ask ourselves from those salt when we analyze the leaf, what from those, what's the proportion of uh, salt that accumulate on the outer surface of the leaves and what penetrate inside. So in uh, uh, 2021, we took uh, leaves and we washed them and we compare the, con the analysis of sodium and potassium on chlorine of leaves that were washed and those that were not washed. So those figures telling us that there is significant accumulation of uh, salt, part of it on the outer surface of the leaf and part of it penetrate inside the leaf and probably uh, cause uh, the damages as we have seen. 
Another measurement that we have done was uh, to assess the uh, water status of the tree, the water stress. So we use a pressure bump to assess steam water potential. And we can see a significant uh, reduction. We need to remember that those values are uh, uh, minus. A significant reduction in uh, uh, water stress when we uh, use a, a cooling system. We can see uh, in the left side, uh, <clears throat> the orchard in Gevim, we can see that in the control, the tree were minus uh, eight megapascal while the treatment reduced to minus four megapascal. And also in SAD, we see a similar trend of reduced uh, uh, what water potential when we uh, apply the uh, water. We have two main explanation. One, uh, of course, we reduce the VPD, increase the humidity, reduce the temperature, so low, lower amount of uh, water evaporate. But we think there is another topic because generally we apply the water only uh, when we use drip irrigation, only uh, the wet bulb is uh, providing the water while we are using spray, all the area uh, root can absorb uh, water. And we believe that it's allow trees in this very severe uh, situation of a very uh, dry and hot climate to absorb more water uh, since they have more roots uh, that can uh, deliver the water because ev all the soil is irrigated, not only the, uh, the wet bulb below the drippers. So this is another advantage, not only cooling, but also uh, improving significantly the uh, water status of the trees. And the, <clears throat> the next issue was uh, actually the, the yield. Surprisingly this year, that uh, 2020, the, rel the relative yield were, uh, uh, were nice, were good. Uh, still, we found significant impact, positive impact of the uh, water application on the tree productivity. We can see if we look on uh, uh, total weight per tree in Gevim, we can see that in the control, we have a little bit above 50 uh, kg per tree, and it's increased to around 70 in the treatment uh, plot. And if we look about uh, those uh, values in uh, uh, weight per hectare, we see increase from around 22 ton per hectare to about uh, almost 40 uh, ton per hectare. And again, it's relatively high yield in Israeli uh, scaled for uh, avocado. So even though the tree exposed to a very severe heat uh, 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 wave, even the control, the uh, relatively, uh, the yield was, was high, but with cooling system, and no matter which type of cooling system we use, it's uh, uh, increased uh, significantly. So we saw a significant increase in productivity. Uh, we didn't saw any uh, significant change in uh, uh, fruit size. Even We even can see a little bit that in the control, the fruit were a little bit uh, bigger, but it's probably due to the uh, fruit load on the tree that was higher in the treatment trees. Uh, in, in 2021, we look whether we can uh, save some water and go to a lower uh, level of water application of uh, 10 uh, cubic meter per uh, hectare. And uh, as you can see here from the picture in the two uh, plot here in the lower side, uh, we succeeded to reduce the temperature only to 35 uh, or 33 degrees Celsius. Uh, which is not enough. It's not what we are looking for, we are look for. So we believe that application of uh, 10 cubic meter per hectare uh, uh, is not enough. Uh, so our conclusion, sp sprinkler of uh, 20 cubic meter per uh, uh, hour per hectare can provide sufficient protection against heat waves. Threshold for the system operation might be temperature above 36 degrees Celsius and relative humidity below 30%. Special attention while using uh, low quality water. And uh, I just want to uh, thank the um, uh, Israeli Plant Production and Marketing Board and the Chief Scientist of Minister of Agriculture for the financial support and for the grower uh, that allow us to work in the uh, orchard. 
Thank you for listening. Thank you, Arnold. Are there any questions? Because I've got a question. Um, first of all, 264, uh, 17 cubic meters per hectare works out to about 2,000 gallons per acre. So the 17 and the 32 are about 2,000 gallons per acre, and the uh, 32 is about 4,000 gallons per acre per hour. So how long did you run the systems at 40 degrees? Would you run it uh, for two hours or three hours or four hours, or would you run it continuously? Or We run the system in accordance to the, if we stand in the threshold, all the time that uh, we are above the 33 degrees Celsius and below 30 percent uh, relative humidity, the system was operated. So it was around, uh, in those hot days, it was around uh, seven, eight hours per day, even more. Oh, okay. Uh, we've got a question here in the chat. Wow, what else do they do to get 20 to 40 tons per hectare production? I mean, they're, 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 these are well-run orchards, I take it. Yeah, very good growers, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? And it's not the average yield. Yeah, <laughs> it was very good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have, oh, here's a question. Was it operated automatically via weather station and sensors? Was it automatically? Automatically, yeah. We have sensors in the system and uh, of relative humidity and uh, temperature, and it's automatically operated, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, uh, okay. Zach says, uh, for productivity, are you measuring reduction of drop or are you measuring the following year's fruit set? So are you measuring the current effect of the heat on, on the fruit that's on the tree or are you just measuring, or are you measuring the, the, uh, the yield at, the, at your normal harvest period? Again, the, we are facing those heat waves uh, immediately after flowering. And those heat waves cause dramatic, uh, substantial uh, fruited drop. So they affect the yield of this year, not the following uh, year. Okay. Okay, with that, um, Arnon said he'll stick around for the whole session. Um, we're gonna have a question and answer at the very end. The um, next speaker is Francisco Mena, who's a uh, Chilean and his business partner is Francisco Garziabal, who's a professor of horticulture at the Catholic University in Valparaiso. Um, they're based in Santiago and they have a consultancy company, GAMA, G-A-M-A Limited, which also conducts research. So they're consultant researchers. Uh, they consult internationally and regularly present their results at World Avocado Congress and are considered uh, avocado orchard leaders in technology. So, um, so with that, uh, Francisco, would you like to take over? Okay. Thank you very much. I'll put my presentation. Uh, can, can you see well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so fir first of all, I just want to, to thank uh, Ben and the, and the commission for, for inviting me to participate today. Uh, I was just worried about the, the heat waves that we have, but just looking at the temperatures that Arnold was showing, uh, probably here that they, they, they are not regularly so bad as, as, as the, the numbers that, uh, that, that Arnold shows in, in Israel. But anyway, we have dealt with some problems in, 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 in the last years. So we, we have been trying to, to work, do something uh, to work it out and, and do some of the preliminary results that I will show you. When, you, when we look at the, the main factors uh, affecting avocado production, just like any other crop, uh, we need climate, soil, and water. And um, 
they, they have to mix very well in order to produce uh, commercially successful crops. And during the past decade, we have seen a change in the, or, or a variation in two of these conditions, let's say uh, climate and, and, and water. And we've had uh, unusual weather conditions in some year, which also have been related to, to water issues, like in our case with, with drought problems. And, and that has been a change in the past years in, in avocado growing. Uh, basically, uh, the, the issues of temperature, we don't know if it's uh, changing completely the weather or if it's part of a cycle. Anyway, if it's a cycle, probably Earth cycles are a lot longer than our lives. So we have to adapt and we have to look for tools to, to manage uh, these conditions. And uh, when, when, when we see what, what has been changing, with climate, we have been facing heat and frost conditions, both. Uh, actually, two weeks ago, we had a really bad frost here in Chile, which is not usually at this time of the year. Um, but anyway, either he's heat or frost, it leads to stress and we need to address those stress conditions. Uh, what does the future look for us? If you see, this is the evolution of what uh, the University of Chile thinks it will happen with uh, maximum temperatures in January in the middle of summer for us. And the red it gets, the higher the temperatures, and you can see that this is the actual baseline and uh, how it will change in the future. This is 2050 and this is 2017. And, and, and it only shows that probably conditions are be more and more complicated when we look at what's going on with the high temperatures. On the other hand, minimum temperatures during winter will go up also. So it means that we will have uh, less frost problems probably in the future, which will probably allow us to move the avocado industry in the long run to uh, the southern, to the central southern part of Chile. Uh, you see that the, the risk of frost in, in this map shows that uh, the, the risk gets lower and lower as, as we move into, into the future. And this is uh, what they did for projecting what the potential avocado areas will be in the future. And you can see that the green areas, which are potentially for uh, good for avocados, will, will develop and move a lot south in the, in the future years. So uh, this whole temperature issue causes that we have problems in the, in the areas where we produce right now, but probably it will also give us some uh, opportunities in the future in, in different areas. Also, also from, from, from the Ministry of, uh, of Environment, what they are showing is that these are years or days above 86 Fahrenheit, which is 30 degrees Celsius for us. And what it is today, the number of days are shown in these colors, what it is today and what it will be between 2035 and 2065. And, and it means, and it shows that we will have a lot more days during the year with temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, and when we look at what the change will be, you can see that there are some areas, and this is the avocado growing area, most of it, and you will have at least 20 or 25 or even 30 days more with temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit during the year, which, will, which can be uh, potentially complicated for, for avocados. When we look at the temperatures in some of the production areas, you can see that this is probably what we were used to. Uh, this is the, the Peuma area, which is south of Santiago, close to the Rappel Lake. And you can see that in a normal year, and we, we've set a threshold of 33 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, we went a little bit lower than what uh, Arnon showed that was 36. Uh, and during 2018, 2019, that spring summer season for us, we had 19 days above that threshold until March 31st. So it wasn't really a bad year. But the year after that, we had 42 days with high temperatures from September and until uh, the end of March. And we had several days still during the flowering period with high temperatures. And that caused a really low year in most of our production areas. What happened the year after that? We had only five days with high temperatures. So it's not been a constant for us, but we have seen it more often uh, happening in, in, in our avocado production areas. What happened this year, it was also a, a, a low year with, uh, it, we didn't have much of a problem with uh, high temperatures. So 
we did we were able to collect some data on the trials that we have but we on one hand we're happy we don't have the events on the other hand as we set up the trials as you don't have the events probably uh, you cannot get as much data as you want if, if this is a normal or generic tree uh, it looks like an orange tree but the the, the fruit looks like apples so uh, basically what the tree does is that it pulls water from the soil and into the atmosphere to cool itself. And during this process, what it does is that it brings water out and, and also minerals come in with, with, with the water flow and through the sunlight and, and the energy that comes with us with that and with the CO2 from the atmosphere, the tree through photosynthesis will produce uh, carbohydrates and uh, send uh, oxygen into into the atmosphere. What happens when 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 we have a very hot day? Probably we get the opposite. That the, the the tree will start uh, into a respiration process. It will in, at some point consume oxygen. Uh, it will send CO two to the atmosphere, and we'll use some of those carbohydrates uh, to uh, be able to through radiation, send some of the heat into, into the atmosphere and not be uh, exposed to very uh, to that much high temperatures. So the tree cannot lose as much temperature as it does because the stomata will close and, and, and the water will not be flowing uh, as easy as it does in normal days. But it does not also affect the photosynthesis. We also know that uh, avocado pollen has a very thin out layer uh, that protects it, protects it. So when it's very hot or very low humidity levels, what it causes that the, the, the pollen suffers, it loses viability. And in some of those years we get on some stage with very high temperatures, if it happens, happens too early, uh, we will see a, a lot of uh, seedless fruits that will easily drop. At the beginning of the, of the fruit set process, also we will see some heavy fruit drop. And if it happens during the summer, we will also see a heavy drop uh, during, during the last stages of the summer, beginning of the autumn. The other thing that we've been able to, to see when we get these heavy, hot years is that um, the fruit, uh, the size of the fruit drops down. And uh, that's probably because the, the, the tree loses a lot of energy uh, in respiration and not uh, being able to use that energy into fruit growth. One of the things that, that we have done to, to, to manage these hot days or in, 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 in mainly in inland areas where we get more heat is to uh, do daily short irrigations to maintain the root system on the upper levels of the soil with more moisture. And you can see this, uh, the soil probes, and you can see here the, the common and long irrigations and also the small irrigations that show an everyday increase on the humidity at 10 centimeters uh, in the soil, at 20 centimeters in the soil, but then at 40 or 60 centimeters, you can see that they do not get any effect from this short irrigation. So it's basically uh, done for maintaining uh, humidity and lowering the stress on those roots that are in the, in the upper part of the, of the soil. The other thing that uh, we plan to, to try, uh, we, we did just some trials and we, we've been able with short times uh, to use the frost control systems. We use it for about two hours one day when we were getting just this year, we, 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 did, we were able to use it. We were able to see a four Celsius drop with a two hour uh, usage, but we, we plan to, to start something more, more um, detailed as a research as we, are able to, as, as we get more more a year with more problems. But in, in areas where we have this, uh, this frost control damage, we could be, uh, have the chance to, 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 to use it to control uh, temperature. As we face this, these issues, we also bought uh, uh, an equipment to measure uh, leaf uh, stomatal conductance and, and temperature. And one of the things that we saw last year is that uh, as temperature raises up, at some point uh, you can see in, in gray, that's the temperature of the ambient of the weather station and the red is the, the, temp the leaf temperature. And you can see that at some point uh, leaf temperature raises above ambient temperature. 
and that as temperature rises, stomatal conductance drops down, and that means that photosynthesis also drops down, so, so the tree isn't able to produce energy as much as it, with the efficiency that it could uh, do on, on, on normal days. Our, our main focus so far has been to try uh, uh, products that are, let, let's say, screen or, or stress protectants. Uh, as you know, here in Chile, probably similar like in California, many of uh, the orchards we have are up on the hills. So first thing was to see if, if, if we, what, what's the, the application efficiency with, with products like this. And uh, at least so far, we have a lot to improve. You can see this picture. You can see this was sprayed from with, with a supposed a special cannon from the roads. And you can see that the areas in the middle of the blocks, they are greener. So that means that the product didn't, didn't reach those areas. Uh, one of the products that we were able to, to try this year was a product that's supposed to reduce stress conditions. Uh, it contains uh, zinc, copper, and uh, other, uh, I think, oxygenic compounds. It's called Resist, and we and and what, what we like the most about this is that uh, they mentioned that it could be also applied through irrigation, which if it works up on the hills, it would be very useful for us. So these are the treatments. We have uh, the control. We have foliar applied. We have applied through irrigation, and we have uh, foliar plus irrigation. And we applied it every 20 days during December, January, February, and March, which are the times in which we have more uh, heat problems. This was the block distribution of the, of the trial. It was a randomized block design with six blocks and then 18 trees per treatment. As of the leaf analysis, we didn't see any differences between treatments, so I'm going to go real quick on that. But here, here we saw uh, on, on a hot day on February 3rd, we can see that there was a nice difference in stomatal conductance between all treatments and, and the control. And at two times during the day, probably this is at 10 o'clock in the morning, isn't as important as probably from noon on. And this is the one that showed statistical difference. But even though later in the day, even though there were not statistical differences, you can see that the difference between the control and the different treatments was, uh, was very big. So that means that those trees were making more photosynthesis than this one. Um, what we were able to see with the temperatures is that during the morning, the leaves were cooler than the ambient temperature, probably at noon, temperature was similar between the leaves and the ambient temperature. And later in the day, you can see that the control had temperatures above the ambient uh, temperature and uh, treatments was cooler than, really cooler than the control at two o'clock in the afternoon. And then in the rest of the day, two of the treatments and then three of the treatments were, were cooler than the control. So that means that at least we have some indications that it could lead to a lower uh, to just lowering the temperature uh, on the leaves. Uh, and, and, and if the leaves are not that hot, probably they, they will not close tomatoes as they would with higher temperatures. Well, we got as uh, results for the first year, even though we didn't have a difference, a statistical difference in production, there was a, uh, some increase with a 44, 10 and 43.5 increase on, in production, uh, depending on, on the treatment. And you can see that the control produced 15.4 thousand uh, uh, pounds per acre, 23.21.3, 23 the, the foliar applied product. The irrigation didn't have much difference with the, with the control. And the one that combined foliar and irrigation was again higher than the, than the control, but unlucky for us, it wasn't this year with statistical difference. As the, as the control produced uh, less fruit uh, than, than the other treatments, the, the fruit weight uh, wasn't as, uh, was better than the others, but probably there is a relation with, with production. When we look at what happened with the kilos per tree uh, or pounds per tree, depending on fruit size, you can see that the best uh, treatment was the foliar applied resist. Uh, 
uh, produce 35.3 pounds per tree of sizes 50 and up, compared to the control that produced 28.7, 22.5, the, the irrigation applied product, and 28.9 with no difference with the control with the, the, the other one. The other thing that we've tried so when we're looking as we are system of trying to reduce the stress on the upper roots is SEVA. SEVA is a starch-based hydrating granule that's supposed to absorb more moisture and, 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 and make it available for the trees on, on, on conditions in which it cannot, it's probably not as available from the soil, so probably hot days. Uh, so we tried uh, two different uh, rates per acre, 13.5 and 18. Uh, applied one as a surface application and the other one in two, two or three trenches per tree. This is on trees planted at three by three meters uh, in 2009. This is what the trial was uh, distributed like. Again, you have the treatments, the application dates, Foliar analysis, there were no differences between treatments. And this is what happened with uh, two years in uh, production. You can see that um, the higher rate when we applied it as trenches uh, had more fruit the first year, the, sorry. The higher rate applied uh, applied at uh, uh, as a, the, this one sorry so, this one is applied as a surface application. This one is applied as a trench application. You can see that this one has more fruits in 2020. This one has more fruits in 2021. Um, what happens with the production? With the production happens pretty much the same. Uh, treatment number three produces more fruit in 2020 and treatment number two produces more fruit in 2021. Uh, making it that treatment number two, which is the uh, trench application of 13.5 uh, pounds per, per treatment per tree, per hectare, so per acre, sorry, is uh, the best uh, treatment with the 26.03 uh, increase in, in production. As a fruit size, there were some differences, uh, but you can see that as treatment number two was one of the most productive, it also showed all the, one of the best sizes, so that's uh, very interesting. And when we look at the size distribution, we can see that treatment number two and treatment number three uh, produced uh, more kilos above uh, sizes 50. Well, one of the things that we are, as I said at the beginning, uh, the, the first, the, these two years, we haven't had that many temperatures above uh, 33 degrees Celsius. So uh, we, we still expect that uh, we, we have to try this under harder conditions uh, to see if, 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 if under those conditions that we have some uh, performance of, of this treatment, of these treatments like uh, we've seen with, with smoother temperatures. The other thing that we have to really take care also and, 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 and just as a major comment is that while you have heat waves and you have still fruit on your trees and you have to pick, you have to be very careful on how you treat your fruit because uh, if you take a look what happens with the temperature, you can see if you do not cover your fruit with special uh, leads on the, on the bins, you can have very high difference on temperature. You can see here, you can the, the fruit that's on the second layer has a, an average of 77 uh, degrees Fahrenheit as of the most hot fruit in that bin had 101 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So, and if we do not cover that, if we do not protect that fruit, that will also cause us a problem because we will have uneven migration and uneven behavior of that fruit during post-harvest. Just want to thank the, and acknowledge the growers that help us uh, finance for, for some of these uh, research projects and our team that uh, does all the research and, and allows us to get all this information. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Francisco. Hey, could you uh, explain the resist and the Ziba again? What it, What is resist and wh what do you think the mechanism of its effect is? And Ziba <laughs> is basically changing the soil moisture holding content? Yeah, yeah, that's what Ziba does. It, it, it's supposed to absorb more water during times when you have excess of water and, and, and release it easily to the, to the plant. Uh, when 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 the, it's not as easy for for the roots to take it from the soil because the the, the moisture level of the soil probably on those hot days goes goes uh, uh, down very quickly. And and as of the resist, it's supposed to be a stress control product uh, that that allows the, the the tree not to close tomato as easy as it does without the application of, of these products. And if, if the tree does not close this tomato, it does maintain the water flow and maintaining the water flow, it will help transpiration, uh, transpiration and, 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 and losing of temperature. Cool. Yeah. So, and, and what is the chemical formulation of the resist? Resist is uh, zinc, copper, and some uh, auxins, if I'm not mistaken. Oxygen. Natural. That, that's what they claim. It's it's natural oxygens. Okay. Okay. So we've got two other questions. Uh, is the application through inline drippers or micro sprinklers? How, In our case, case, it's, it's uh, micro sprinklers. Micro. And what's the cost of the foliar applied resist? More or less. I don't have, I don't have the exact number, but it's probably per hectare. It's probably a complete treatment of about. $300 per hectare the whole season. So it's not much. Okay, so the material itself then would cost something on the order yeah. of, okay. Um, are there any other questions that, from the audience? So we'll have a more general discussion at the very end after all the other presentations. Um, so, oh, there, Okay, we have steep slopes on much of our groves and maintain thick ground cover. How does this affect the usefulness of these treatments? I, I'm assuming that he's talking about the the, the zeba. If if how if you apply this on top of a a leaf mulch, is it going to have any effect? Probably, if if you have sprinklers, it will drop down with the water into the soil. I would guess. Okay, so uh, the zeba is applied through the irrigation. We we have no, it wasn't applied through the irrigation. Okay, uh, it, it was applied manually. So that that's that's the main problem it has. Uh, but but anyway, I think it's not easy to apply any any type of polymer through irrigation because you have the risk that it will start forming a gel inside your irrigation system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, our next speaker is Derek Knoble. He's a grower here in, in uh, Ventura County. He's been all over the world uh, as president of the California Avocado Society. He's a graduate of UC Davis and uh, got his MBA at Santa Clara University. Um, he's been farming walnuts as well as other deciduous crops in the um, Chico area. And uh, he's been a farmer of lemons and avocados in Santa Maria and, and Orange County. Um, he's been fortunate to be at all the avocado congresses. Um, so he's gonna be talking about his experiences with foliar applied materials, as well as other activities that uh, mitigate heat in avocado orchards. So with that, Derek, please take it over. Thank you, Ben. I'm pleased, uh, uh, pleased to have this opportunity and follow Francisco. Uh, you mentioned the uh, World Avocado Congress. I had the pleasure of meeting Francisco in Chile back in 2007. He's a great researcher looking for practical solutions. Um, today, I thank the organizers for the opportunity to share my own experiences with you and hear from experts around the world that are way, way smarter than I am. That said, I'm looking forward to the next World Congress in New Zealand in April 2023, if they let us in. So we'll see how that goes, but check out that website. Um, 
What you're looking at here is Mother Nature, a photo of Mother Nature's uh, best heat mitigation uh, product, which is our coastal marine influence. That seems to be appearing at different times of our years and uh, disappearing when we most need it, sometime in the uh, just post bloom period. So we've been faced with a lot hotter temperatures or really a lot of temperature spikes. Today, I hope to address these topics in my presentation. Uh, my comments are based purely on my experience and are always modifiable subject to experimentation as we deal with these increasingly extreme weather events. This keeps farming fun and challenging. Most of the products I mentioned today uh, have been used for many, many years on many different crops. So I assume they're effective and safe when use is directed. Of course, we're always pushing the envelope I'm looking for uses that may or may not be as directed on the label. So be safe. Of course, all these products have limits of their effectiveness. It's just up to you to find out what works for you. The major categories of uses of sun protectants that I see are, um, as we've mentioned, uh, Francisco mentioned canopy and fruit protection uh, post bloom. That can be done by ground or by air. Um, bark protection uh, of young tree trunks, uh, perhaps stump tree trunks uh, that have been cut back, um, exposed limbs during pruning, uh, especially important as you transition from the cool springs to the warm or very warm summers. Uh, I've heard it mentioned a couple times after fire or frost recovery, these uh, sun protectants are important parts of the rehabilitation uh, of your trees. Another area, I just throw this out for you. I don't know anybody that wants to steal your old crop that's painted white or, or got crop white or something else on it. They generally look the other way and go to the other grove. I've been told by the packing houses, uh, uh, they could tell if it was my fruit because I was one of the only ones uh, using these products when I farmed in Orange County. The goal of a full canopy spray is really to protect that new crop, the leaves and the wood that are associated with it in its early growth stage. Pass is really the most prone to this exterior set and has a lot less leaf coverage during the spring shoot flush. Tree architecture, spacing, pruning, and varietal selection is something you can do before, but Hass is really like that walnut variety that I think Bruce would talk about that points up to the sky. We were always spraying serves when I farmed them uh, in the early 80s, just because their fruit was exposed and hanging out there for the sunshine. Here's a helicopter shot working a southwest, southwest facing gully, which is our warmest, and ridgeline. Uh, this costs us about $2 a gallon for the water, approximately $50 for this application at 25 gallons per minute, plus the material somewhere between one and three gallons per acre. You do need really to apply these materials before the events. Um, one tip I could give you if you have a ground sprayer and a lot of ground to cover because you don't have a lot of notice for these events is I've gone every other row at hundred gallons per acre and then come back if I have time, but it seems to do the job. Uh, the bottom right photo is what we're all trying to avoid. And you all know what we lose from fruit uh, downgrading from first grade to second grade. You do the math. You guys do the math. The gals at a 50% increase in your number twos at today's prices, and you may become a fan. I definitely watch forecast for severe temperature spikes, moving from the early summer to fall, especially when it dries out and your humidities drop. I, I consider just treating some of the parts of your groves um, that might be prone to high temps have a lot of exposed fruit to get a handle on it, get comfortable with the practice. Uh, here's a coverage photo left from the Pershade website, which is one of the liquefied calciums. Uh, notice neither picture is blanket light, but I think, and, and what the manufacturers are saying that this does prevent or put enough material to improve the reflectivity of the, of, uh, of the growth. Since a couple, every couple of degrees helps, uh, 
no, I can't answer, uh, like these scientists who are doing a wonderful job, how much it actually drops the temperature in my groves. But I can say it does prevent this early sun, sunburn and downgrade and maintains the canopy that you have. And you can kind of see how it's popped out of there and just sailing away in the middle of the summer. It does stick pretty good, but uh, we're not deeply penetrating the canopy. Unfortunately, the one time I did it by helicopter, <laughs> the winds blew it off in the following October, all that exposed fruit. So, but yes, I'd do it again if record heat was uh, forecast. Here's a different application to young foliage. Uh, we were planting pretty late uh, in July, which is pretty warm season for us. Uh, temperatures were predicted pretty high. Uh, we actually hit 107 degrees a week later. So we were looking for a quick way to cover our young, uh, newly planted trees that would work with the only sprayer that we had. And uh, we opted for about a quarter rate uh, of the maximum of per shade, about two and a half gallons per hundred. And we applied it with a little tractor and hand sprayer. These were sprayed just as the day we were planted. I didn't really observe any, any damage on the tender foliage. Uh, we did observe some trunk damage uh, on our Southwest, the warm side. You know, if I did it again, I'd have painted the trunk sooner, which you'll see on the next slide. You know, I'm not a big fan of spraying all the leaves and making everything white. I think it interrupts your transpiration and, and these young trees need to grow. They're your engine. Um, here you can see we're using probably a water-based paint at a one uh, gallon of paint to two gallons of water solution. Uh, we're doing the sunniest sides and upper branches. You know, honestly, my guys are artists. <laughs> so while I don't use a lot of material, it is a lot of labor. But you know what? It's not really a lot when you're looking at $50 trees staked and in the ground in California. So we're doing this as soon as possible. Uh, there is there backing up, there is an organic option. Um, paint, I don't know how you report that if you're an organic grower, uh, but crop white too or surround our products at one pound to one gallon plus a little bit of SKH dry spreader uh, are registered organic. Work pretty well. Searching for complete bark coverage and, and the brilliant white that I heard Ben talk about in his last seminar. Uh, we do these large 45-year-old uh, trunks would swallow the material, swallow the labor. And so we were looking for a cheaper way to do this. All we need is about six months to get through the hot summer uh, after we stumped these a month or two ago. Um, we, we found uh, and we, we, we selected uh, hydrated limes Know, that we had left over in our barn from spraying citrus in the winter. Uh, we attempted to get very high rates of 150 pounds of lime per 100 gallons, but it pretty much plugged all my equipment. The skinny hoses requires tons of agitation. So we backed that mix down to about 75 pounds per 100 with that little sprayer that you saw, see in the picture on the right. Uh, and we were able to increase it to about a <clears throat> one pound per gallon or a hundred pounds in a hundred uh, using a better uh, mechanically agitating uh, speed spread later on in the project. We just sacrifice a little bit of brilliance, but I think it's going to do the job and it's a heck of a lot cheaper, faster. Um, uses about two gallons a tree. And that's about 60 cents a trunk to do. Most of the time was spent moving, moving the tractor. Um, you know, pruning and protecting your limbs that are uh, out there in the middle of the um, spring pruning. Usually you're pruning the spring, we're changing the tree shapes. Uh, the trees aren't really ready for it. Uh, you can see on the picture on the right, uh, just after pruning, there's some leaf damage uh, just from opening that canopy pretty severely and removing a limb. There's a couple ways to do it. You have a spray on, like you can see on the left. Uh, you may hit old fruit and canopy uh, with that uh, thick sauce, but uh, just be judicious. Um, the photo on the right, we actually roll it on and uh, uh, just follow right away. That works a lot better in the steep terrain that I heard Francisco mentioning. It's, you know, it's what you can actually get done that matters. So we use rollers or, or spray paint. Um, it's important to uh, 
do that immediately or as soon as you can if the temperatures are hot. If not, this is what you get. Um, often uh, heavily laden has limbs bend over if they haven't acclimatized to the heat. Um, as, as they load up with new crop, they're really good, good candidates for a re reflective product. On the right, you can see the opening of this canopy uh, probably caused uh, burning of the wood. You can see it kind of cracking on this little shoot, uh, but it's pretty severe sunburn. Ben, ben sent me these pictures because I don't have anything that looks like this. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but that summer pruning, if you're going late and opening, is pretty hard, as you can see. The cambium literally boils, um, and you have a permanently girdled limb that probably has to be removed. And if you have fruit on the, the side of a young shoot, it probably will not size. Now, the, the bottom line is much of this injury is preventable with the use of protectants. You know, there are, where they've mentioned, are obviously some other uh, forms of heat mitigation in our playbook. We're just beginning to look at mulches for their canopy temperature effects. But I think we all know they cool the area and the surrounding areas. Contrarily, they do this, the opposite in the winter where they actually uh, reflect heat absorption, making groves colder. So in some respect, they must be cooling all the time. Um, organic mulches, as you will see, come in many forms from the very coarse to the very far. The, the light to the dark, but I think they all work. Plastic mulches are being studied as well as shading, uh, overhead shading of the avocado to deal with these increasingly warm climate uh, changes. And they're topics unto themselves, so I won't address them today. A uh, couple quick pictures, <laughs> pretty hot, newly planted soil uh, on the left, mulched a few weeks later on the right. The next slides will show how we use the mulch middle as well to mitigate summer heat. And that photo on the left is actually uh, shows the lemon mulch from trees ground in place, left in place in the middle. Um, <laughs> that grove is actually quite cool. Um, the heat reflection and erosion control properties are, are, are obvious. Uh, the downside are, is fire vulnerability, which may which is why the previous slide, we didn't mulch the middles. So you have to take into account what you're doing. This is a grove in the middle of all our groves. So not as uh, a suspect for, for fire. Um, the photo on the right, obviously we added, we had to add mulch uh, back in uh, more of the commercial grade. Um, and uh, we covered the drippers. Of course, uh, Ben is going to say, always keep those trunk clear, which we did after this picture was taken. But uh, I prefer the coarse mulch, as coarse a mulch as you can, like the middles. Um, but I want you to notice how that moisture wicks up and stays on the mulch uh, with a little spray jet application. So I presume it's cooling and modifying the little environment around that young plant. Obviously, we've talked about cover crops, um, passive cooling in the spring and summer water absorbing in the winter, all good properties. On the contrary, they uh, require maintenance and if in the cold area, um, actually drop the temperatures in the wintertime. My experience is that cover crops get out-competed as shade becomes predominant in orchard. Uh, if I had to choose, I prefer drought tolerant grasses, flowers, and legumes that fade early in the spring and don't use my existing water. Finally, here we are. Let's talk a little bit about these mysterious sun protectants more specifically. There are four real families that, that I use and I'm familiar with, there may be more. The clays uh, are kaolin-based clay products. Uh, I think Francisco had a great shot. Uh, I'm not sure what was used in that, but it covers the leaves white. Uh, calcium uh, or hydrated lime, calcium carbonate or lime-based products. Paint-based products. Um, are also out there. And I see some of the old recommendations using paint on trees. That's not something I would do, but uh, confine that to trunks. Uh, we've talked a little bit uh, about anti-transference over the years. I don't have any experience any, but the fact of shutting off an avocado when it needs to breed just, just scares the heck out of me. Um, yeah, they have to shut down for a few hours a day, but I don't want them shutting down for a few weeks at a time if these transference work. Biostimulants uh, resist is an, is an example. All these uh, are, 
are modifying plant responses to stress. So they're not really radiation blockers. I do find them difficult to evaluate. Thank you, Francisco, for continuing to look at these type of products scientifically. Um, but I find them very hard to evaluate in the field. Truthfully, I do employ uh, different biostimulant response uh, products in response to stress, but you know, really the whole idea of today's talk is to try to avoid that scenario. This is by no means a complete list, but these are products I'm familiar with. The clays are on the top, um, starting with Surround and Brant Crop White. The SKH is a dry sticker, um, Omri, Omri listed as well. The liquefied limes are on the bottom, per shade and diffusion O. Per shade uh, is by Nova Source. Diffusion O is uh, Wilbur Ellis's product. I don't know if you've ever tried to mix a slurry of lime and water. It takes a long time. These guys have figured out how to do it and package it and make it very easy to use. All these are easy to look up. So remember to consult your PCA or your applicators for their suggestions. So a little bit on the product characteristics that I've seen, the rates and the costs uh, of the kale and clay surround is very easy to mix. It's a very fine grind product. On the downside, it's EPA registered as a pesticide, so you must report it. It sprays through the equipment extremely well um, at rates of 25 to 50 pounds per 100 gallons. It's harder to wash off than lime-based products. And you can really cook this stuff on a uh, spring old crop that was sprayed on the outside. Uh, you, you know they, they've had challenges with it. Uh, they have acidic wash directions on their label. It runs about $1.55 a pound. Crop white, uh, another type of kale and clay. Uh, as I mentioned, you really had to slurry it up before you pour it in. It's very sticky. It's hard to wash off as well. These two products require strong pump agitation, but not uh, as much on the mechanical side. But look at these rates, costs of 80 to 100 pounds. Um, I use a half rate if I'm going on uh, a ground rig of 50 pounds per 100. But you can all use, also use this as a fairly treat, cheap brush on product at a pound per gallon. Runs about 70 cents a pound. Calcium carbonate uh, requires uh, or hydrated lime requires a lot of mechanical agitation, but it does wash off easy. You can add a sticker for trunk sprays. Uh, Maya and I run 75 to 100 pounds per 100 gallons. You know, if I'm doing a canopy, which I haven't really used this on, I'd probably choose a half rate and be about 50 pounds per 100 gallons. Pretty cheap. Uh, liquid calcium carbonates per shade and, and diffusion are very easy mixing. Uh, pump agitation is sufficient. You don't need mechanical. Uh, they're more expensive, but labor saving and the air applicators love them. They're a lot easier than some of the dry products. Um, <clears throat> the one to three gallons, they run about 30 bucks a gallon. The sticker, uh, you can adjust for your use. Um, and definitely if you're spraying it over uh, old crop uh, and it's gonna get cooked on in the summer, I would remove uh, some of the adhesives. Paint, uh, not really in my book, uh, recommended for spray paint, uh, spraying on the canopy, but uh, with a good sticker, it is a great sticker at one to uh, one gallon of paint to two gallons of water. Uh, much harder to run through a piece of equipment. I don't even want to try, to be honest. Best in wet weather, early in the season, and on young trees by brush. That's, that's where we're at. Ben's going to say, hold the questions to the end, I imagine. Yeah. There was, um, on chat, there was a question. Can you explain painting trunks and older scaffold branches on those stump trees? Are the, are the woody trunks subject to burn too? That's, that's a great question. Um, some of those are pretty big and burly uh, uh, trunks that you saw just stumped, uh, you know what? I'm not even gonna take the chance that they're subject to sunburn as they regenerate an entire canopy. So that's generally been our practice. As far as the medium size one to six inch limbs, um, 
yes, they're very susceptible because that cambial layer is not protected by a very thick bark layer. Yeah. So I would recommend uh, those pruning limbs to be protected. Uh, as far as the young trees, don't waste any time in our climates. Um, we're generally, in our case, we're taking harvesting lemons, taking them out and then putting another crop behind them. So we are definitely uh, pushing the limit of a spring planting and uh, getting those uh, light paints on those canopies. Yeah. And so graphically shown by Francisco and, and mentioned by Arnon and, and also by you, Derek, you know, the, the leaves are transpiring and water is moving through the tree. And if water stops moving, if it's not transpiring, it's not moving through the trunk and the trunk's going to heat up. It's, the, the tree is uh, radiating heat and it's done all through, uh, it's like a radiator. It's, it, water's got to move through it. And if it doesn't, it's going to heat up. So that brings up the question here of anti-transference and reflectance. And uh, one of the questions came up of uh, resist uh, is sold as a foliar uh, plastic anti-transparent. Francisco and Arnon, Derek, what is your opinion of anti-transference? Would uh, resist work as well as a plastic uh, emulsion on the, on the leaf? Well, I'll give it a shot. I don't know resist, um, but it doesn't sound like an anti-transparent. It sounds like a biostimulant. Yeah. And uh, if I'm doing a frost recovery spray um, with calcium or, or clay or, or, or a per shade, um, I would often put zincs and coppers in with those mix. They're all compatible, but they are not anti-transparents. The only anti-transparent I know it's called anti-stress 500. It's generally a yucca plant-based material. Uh, I'm not going to badmouth it because I haven't used it, but it just seems foreign because its job is to seal um, the, the leaf. And we want those stomates working. Yeah. I'm anxious yeah. to hear your comments. I, I don't believe that the, that the, that the resist is the anti-transparent at all. Actually, what, what, it, what you can see is that, that, that the stomatal conductance keeps going up. Yeah, the stomata doesn't close, so that means that, that the tree is, is still transparent. So it's it's not an anti-transparent. Yeah, I'm very intrigued, uh, Francisco, with those types of products which are being peddled at us very quickly, but they're very hard to evaluate. So thank you for bringing your figures to the to the table today. <laughs> Our figures are just, as I said at the beginning, are, are very preliminary. Uh, this is the first year, and we didn't have the, 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 the heat waves that we've had in years like 18, 19. But um, uh, at least we, we, we have the equipment. We're, we're ready to start measuring whenever heat, heat waves come. So I, I think it, it's like evaluating products for frost control or, or for recovering trees from frost. But I just, you know, I'd, I'd sure love to see some growers frost. try it. Yeah. We'd love to see growers try it. That's the only way you get to know it yeah. uh, on some of these products. You don't have to do everything, but uh, try but then, some. But then you have to do the controls to have to have replicates and measurements that are also statistically valid. So at the end of the day, in our case, yeah. So so it's not easy. It's not easy because you have to have the funding on place, everything. And all of a sudden, if you don't have the heat wave, it's like, how come you didn't do the trial? You didn't have heat wave. And one of the ultimate questions here is, can you compare the costs of different options such as sprinkler resist and pure shade? You know, we're talking really big differences in, in, in costs. Um, but but I, I, would, I, would, I would also add to that, that probably when, when you look at Arnon's figures on, on temperatures that they're dealing with, at least compared to ours, it's a lot higher. So um, I would really question that any of these stress control products under 40 or 40 something degrees temperature would have the same effect that it can have here in under 34, 35 degrees Celsius. It's a completely different figure. So I think that those are different situations. Yeah. So Arnon, would you say that that's the greatest impact was with irrigation versus these uh, foliar and soil applied materials? 
In Israel, it's not so common to apply them. We use them in the past, kaolin and other compounds. I can refer only to what I've been tested here about the uh, cooling using uh, spring, spring layers about the canopy, yeah. and it's work. The, the cost is not so high uh, in respect to water cost. We apply it only a few days uh, a year, and the system, pressurized system, already there. And if even in one year you add, I don't know, five uh, ton per hectare, it's cover all the costs. So it's not so expensive. Okay. okay, our next speaker is actually coming by video. Um, it's He's Bruce Lampin and he's our walnut almond specialist up at UC Davis. Uh, he's been working on um, plant responses to temperature and heat and fertilizers and uh, root physiology, and he, he's got some answers about what, what it costs to work on walnuts. And as we all know, an avocado is not a walnut. An avocado is a, another being altogether. But he has done some very extensive physiology work on the use of surround, which is, as Derek explained, is a, is a clay-based material. And um, we're going to hear... Uh, Bruce Lampinen's presentation. And unfortunately, he's not here um, to answer questions, but here he comes. Okay, my name is Bruce Lampinen. I'm a cooperative extension specialist in the plant sciences department at UC Davis. And I'm going to talk about our walnut KO and particle clay film trials. This first trial in Stanislaus County was applied with an air blast sprayer. This particular example, we did this these nuts by hand as well. Um, and this is what the coverage looked like. We got quite good coverage in this trial. We also put on light sensors and temperature sensors to see the effects of the uh, particle clay film on temperature of the leaves. And, that. and this is what we found is that somewhere around 50 degrees centigrade there was a threshold. As long as the nuts never got above that temperature we didn't see any damage. So if you look at the black lines at the very bottom. Those are the nuts that were in the shade. Then the blue lines in the middle were the nuts that were in the sun and treated with particle clay film. And then the red lines are the ones that were untreated in the sun. This is what we found is when the nuts re reached a temperature of about 50 degrees centigrade, then you got some discoloration on the nut surface. And very soon after that, um, the nut would get severe sunburn. This shows the very beginning of the sun, sunburn on the left-hand nut. You can see that little bit of speckling. And that's where the sunburn has just started. This nut had just reached above 50 degrees C for probably an hour or two. And this is what it looked like a couple days later. You can see that whole area has had severe sunburn now. And you can see the coated nut on the right does not show any damage. We also put some nuts into reflective chambers to try to generate these problems when it wasn't quite hot enough. In this case, we sprayed surround, but you can see the left-hand nut, there was an area that didn't get any coverage, probably because there was a leaf laying on there at the time. And you can see that that area over time on the upper right photo, you can see it just starting to discolor, and then you can see within a few days later, it's totally discolored. Now what we found is that most of this damage occurred on the southwest corner of the tree. And you can see the control versus surround on the Chandler in the upper left. We only had about uh, two or three less sunburn nuts on the uh, treated compared to the control. So you can see if you multiply that out, that's not a lot of nuts per acre, maybe a few pounds per acre. And if you look at the Howard, we saw a similar effect, just a little bit of decrease. And same in the Tulare and in the Vina. And this is what we found is that these nuts that were 
in the sun for a long period. Often these weren't the most, the highest up nuts in the orchard, but rather ones that were in a lower position that had shifted from a shaded position into the sun as the uh, weight of the crop pulled down the branches, usually in late June or into July. And this is just a repeat of that. So the most damage we saw were in these little indentations in the southwest corner where a branch had dropped down. And this is what happened. You really needed the sun path to cross across those nuts for oh, one to two hours when you, to get this really severe damage like this. That yellow line shows the path of the sun in the afternoon. The next trials we did were Solano and Yuba County trials. These were done in conjunction with Carolyn DeBuse, Kathy Kelly, and Janine Hazy. The Solano County site, the first one was an organic Tulare orchard. We put two applications on in the first year and three applications on in the second year. And these were all applied from the ground with an air blast sprayer. And this shows the strips of the uh, particle clay film. You can see the white lines through the orchard. Um, in the upper left part of that orchard, you can see where the trees didn't grow as well. That's an area that had a corral historically. So there was some effect of the remnants of that canal on the growth of the trees. That corral, sorry. And what we found is that in most states in this trial, the kaolin treated trees were more stressed than the untreated controls rather than less stressed. And as you can see, this has been a pattern that we've seen pretty consistently in these trials. In terms of nut quality, there were no significant effects the first year, but in the second year, we had significantly smaller average nuts in the kale and treatment. And this shows what happened. The, the reason for this is probably the fact that when you put this on with an air blast spray on an orchard that's pretty heavily shaded like this, this was 80% or more canopy cover. What we did is we coated those lower leaves the most heavily and those leaves were already close to being a net negative in terms of photosynthesis because of shading out. And so what happened is a lot of those lower leaves fell off. You can see in the left hand photo all those surround or a particle claim fil film covered leaves um, on the ground. And what this did is it left these exposed nuts with no leaves in the lower canopy and these are ones that get these quality issues. In this particular trial, we had the uh, kaolin treatment had significantly lower light interception, likely because of that lower canopy leaf loss, and significantly lower yield. Now the next trials were in Yuba County. In this quick case, site number one was a Howard Hedro planting, and we, impl we applied the uh, kale and clay both aerially and from the ground with an air blast sprayer. And again, we had no significant treatment effects on midday canopy light interception yield, yield per unit light intercepted but we also had less extra light nuts in the kale and ground application. That was the only uh, negative effect that we saw on this trial. It was there, was, there were no negative effects from the aerial apply kale. And now Yuba County site number two is a Tulare hedgerow. In this case, we applied two times, but with the helicopter aerial kale because we knew we had the problems with the air blast sprayer from the earlier trials. And again, we found no significant treatment effects on 
midday canopy light interception yield, yield per unit light interception, or in this case, no effects on quality as well. Now the next trial we did was more detailed where we actually overlaid these kaolin sprays on top of fully watered and water stressed walnuts in an ongoing irrigation trial that we had. And these, the idea behind this was to look at the benefits in terms of pest control, sunburn, and water stress relief. And we really were concentrating on the water stress relief because at this time, the uh, companies that were promoting these project products were selling them as an alternative to put on to help relieve stress during drought. And the objectives uh, were to look at the effects of kaolin spray on tree water status, gas exchange, leaf temperature, light interception, and we, would get, we replicated this in well-irrigated and water-stressed walnut. This just shows they are getting prepared to apply the kaolin part. film. In this case, we applied it with a handgun sprayer from up above in a pruning tower. And we got really good coverage in this case. You can see from above, you had a really nice blanket of the uh, particle clay film. And this is the kind of coverage we got that was quite complete. In terms of gas exchange, we measured four leaves per tree, two trees per combination treatment, and five times a day. So a total of 160 measurements. And we also measured stem water potential, a total of 80 measurements over the course of the day. And this is what we found is that for the stress versus well watered treatments, the stress caused lower photosynthesis, lower stomatal conductance, higher leaf temperature, and lower water potential. Pretty much what you would expect. However, for the KLN versus no KLN treatment, um, what we found is that the KLN led to lower photosynthesis had no effect on stomatal conductance, led to lower leaf temperature, and no effect on stem water potential in this case. So kaolin slightly reduced water use efficiency by reducing photosynthesis without reducing stomatal conductance. The question is, why is photosynthesis reduced with kaolin? The hypothesis is that perhaps the physical barrier reduces the light reaching the leaf. So we measured leaf photosynthetic response to light. We did response curve. This shows a light response curve, and you can see that at all the light levels, the kaolin treated trees had lower rates of photosynthesis for a given level of light. And at the canopy level, we also looked at this by using models of photosynthesis. We looked at the light reflection and transmission 
part of the kaolin treated. Versus the control treated. So in this case, we were using a downward facing light part. I look at the amount of light that's reflected off the canopy. And this shows the incident light above the canopy, the yellow line, over the course of the day. And then if you look at the reflected light, you can see it's a much, it's a pretty low percentage of the total light, but you can see the solid colored circles on the bottom. The reflectance was quite a bit less off of the untreated, which are those solid color circles versus the white filled circles above that. And if we change the scale, you can see that there was a, there was significantly more reflected light when we treated with the kale and clay film. And what we found is that there was about 5% more light reflected off the top of the canopy when we used the kale and clay film. So the conclusions are, what does kale and spray do? At the leaf level, it blocked 40% of the light incident on the leaf, reduced photosynthesis by 5 to 10%, had no effect on stomatal conductance, no relief in water stress, and we had reduced leaf temperature was a possible benefit, but really what this did is kept the stomata open longer into the day and resulted in more water use. At the canopy level, we found 5% reduction in light absorption, small loss in canopy photosynthesis, and lead and kale, and led to more stress, not less stress. So should we use kaolin? Yes, if beneficial for pest management and or sunburn. There's no major effects on gas exchange and probably not beneficial in reducing stress. Kale and clay is used on walnuts, mainly by organic growers for, um, for husk fly control, mainly. And if you want to look at the details of this uh, previous study, you can look at it in this Annals of Botany article. Physiological effects of kale and applications in well-irrigated and water-stressed walnut and almond. We also, I didn't mention, but we also repeated all this work in almond and had very similar results. Again, no benefits. So these are the summary of the trials that we did. First, Stanislaus County particle clay impacts on sunburn. We found it was not economically viable. The Solano County Kaolin trial. Kaolin applied with an air blast sprayer resulted in lower canopy defoliation. Um, decreased light interception and decreased yield. In the Yuba County Kaolin trials, we found no benefits to the Kaolin application. And in the Tehama County Kaolin trial, Kaolin led to decreased photosynthesis and increased water tree stress and decreased water use efficiency. So from our experience, we didn't really ever see any beneficial effects from Kaolin in any of these trials. I would suggest that if you're going to use it in avocado, that you should get some good physiologists to look at um, these details on what it, impacts it has on light interception, photosynthesis, and water use. Thank you. Are there any questions? I would now like to turn to um, Miguel Ibarra's um, presentation. Miguel Ibarra is from Spain. He's an agronomist with a company called Agro Agronomica, and they work throughout the Mediterranean, Latin America, Florida, and they've actually been working in California. They work in citrus and almonds and uh, uh, stone fruit, 
table grapes and avocados. They specialize in fertigation and irrigation. Um, and we'll see uh, his presentation now. Um, so, um, this is Miguel Ibarra. He's a, a, a agronomist working out of uh, Seville, Spain. And he's got this uh, study that they did in um, uh, an orchard in Spain. And and this shows you where Spain is relative to where Michoacan is. So they're, they're trying to reproduce the environment of Michoacan where uh, Hass does very well. Um, the area they were working in is this tip near Gibraltar, which is um, near Africa. Um, it's an orchard, a commercial orchard, um, comprised um, about 300 acres. Uh, it's intensively monitored. They have flow meters um, monitoring uh, two different systems, the, their normal drip system, as well as the microsystem. The microsystem is used exclusively for frost control as well as for heat control. So they have uh, two reasons for having the, an over canopy um, uh, sprinkler system. They've got um, conduct, uh, conductivity meters measuring um, uh, salinity of the irrigation water. This is all well water. Um, they are using volumetric soil moisture me measuring devices called Centex. Um, the Centex are devices that have been around for about 30, 30 years. They use dendrometers uh, for measuring uh, tr trunk expansion and contraction. Um, they've got so, uh, weather uh, uh, sensors out there that are actually measure uh, ET. So they're they're measuring every they're measuring soil moisture, plant response, and um, evaporative demand. So they're they're, they're getting a whole uh, snapshot of of what's going on in the orchard. So th this is a area that has got different soils. Um, uh, and so the, these crop sensors are measuring um, with a flow meter uh, to, to measure actual water application to the drip system, uh, a flow meter to measure the emitters that are coming from their over canopy um, sprinkler system. They've got conductivity meters for measuring the quality of the water going into the system and, and the, uh, the water that's coming out the Syntec uh, volumetric conductivity meters um, or capacitance probes, um, the, the dendrometers and the uh, sensors for measuring ET. So this is what the system, they, they've got um, ribulous emitters, uh, nine gallons per hour. Ribulous is a, a, a company out of Israel that brought together Plastro and Roberts irrigation systems. And they've got uh, one riser per tree. Okay, so there are uh, 190 trees per acre. So that means at nine gallons per hour, they're putting out uh, 1,700 gallons per hour per acre. Um, they also had uh, a trial where they're putting out uh, emitters, overhead emitters, every other tree, every other row, which was putting out 430 gallons per hour per acre. So th this is kind of like Arnon's um, system at uh, 17 cubic meters per hectare per, per hour. Um, so uh, th again, they've got two lines, one for irrigation, okay? And these are drip systems. They're double lines, 18 inch spacing, half gallon per hour. Um, they put out, uh, essentially eight, eight gallons per tree per hour. And then the, the um, cooling system, which is the micro sprinklers, these rivulous nine gallon per hour, 
Um, the trees are on a 12 foot spacing, 190 trees per acre. And uh, um, they have the capacity to put out uh, close to 4,000 gallons per acre per hour. So they're also doing evapotranspiration measurements. Um, they're they're using, using these systems actually to, to measure in, 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 in the orchard temperature. And they're, they're comparing the temperatures in, in orchard to a um, uh, weather sensor system that's outside the orchard. So the, the, the differences that um, they're gonna show between inside and outside the orchard temperatures are, are based on two different systems, uh, this one that's in orchard and the one that's outside the orchard. Um, they are irrigating according to Food and Agriculture Organization crop coefficients, which range from 0.6 to 0.85, depending on the season. So they adjust the KC according to the, to the, the stage of, of plant growth, which is basically um, when it's in a vegetative state versus when it's in flowering and fruit set. Um, their distribution uniformity um, for the drip irrigation system is 90%. Um, based on the ET calculations, they're, they put out um, 2.3 acre feet per acre. Okay, so they also are measuring soil moisture with these Centec probes down to um, basically four feet. And based on the Centec measurements, again, these are capacitance measurements, which measure volumetric water content. So they can actually measure um, plant water demand based on depletion in the soil moisture. And they, they actually measured 1.9 or 2.0 acre feet per acre, which is pretty darn close to the, um, to the calculated value for ETO or ET crop. And then they were using the dendrometers. And so the, the dendrometer is a device that's actually screwed onto the, the trunk and it's measuring the, the shrink swell of the, of, the, of the trunk. So as the tree goes under water stress, it, the trunk shrinks and as it imbibes water and swells, it, um, the trunk expands. And over time, the, the, uh, the automatic reading for the dendrometer, you can see the um, shrink swell that's going on. So they've got a measure of actual plant water stress here as well. So again, the overhead irrigation system is um, these rivulous nine gallon per hour um, micro sprayers. Um, and every tree in the orchard has got one and they're putting out about uh, 1700 gallons per acre. And they have a total water use. They, they weren't measuring, they couldn't isolate the amount of water used for the micro sprinkler, they were using it during the frost season. And you can see, this is the amount of water applied during the frost season. And these red lines are the amount of water applied through the canopy overhead irrigation system to the, during the irrigation, uh, during the heat spells. And most of the water really was applied during the frost season. Um, and they apply these small amounts during the heat season. And these were applied um, in small amounts, uh, two to three hours during the hottest period of the day. So it wasn't a continuous run initiated mid-morning throughout the day. They were applied at smaller um, uh, intervals. Um, and this is the, the, these are the temperatures that they, that they were um, measuring. Um, this is the temperature, oh. okay. Midday, it actually diminishes and goes up. So it has a very effective temperature. The, the purple is what was measured outside the orchard. This is the air temperature. So you can see there's a significant drop in, in temperature with these, um, this overhead system. Um, and then uh, as brought up by Arnon, even with this limited amount of applied water, they only applied 10 applications during this um, cycle back in 2021. Um, 
they they were measuring about um, two acre feet per acre applied principally during the frost season. Um, they figured during that heat period, they were putting on about uh, half an acre foot. That was over um, 10 applications. Um, the, uh, uh, one of the, the indicators that um, they were really on top of things. You don't want to go into a heat spell with a water stressed tree and they, they were really on top of the irrigation system. And so this drip system was being monitored through um, its uh, soil moisture through the, the and the um, um, soil, uh, the, the plant status. And um, the, the trees were not going under any water stress really. Um, so uh, the yields that they had in these areas that um, were, were treated were, these, these are actually young trees. These are trees that were um, uh, just coming into bearing. So the, the trees are only th three and uh, four years old and they were getting uh, close to um, 36,000 kilograms, uh, excuse me, 4,000 uh, kilograms per hectare, which you know works out to about 4,000 pounds per acre. And as the trees got older, they put out 10,000 uh, pounds per acre. So that's the experience of Spain. And um, I, I, I wish Miguel were here to answer some questions, but um, yeah, I think just looking at the um, the video that he's got, um, it's it's pretty well understood what happened. So with that, we will now turn to Australia. Hi, my name is Lisa Fife. I am the founder and director of an independent agronomy consulting business called Ripe Horticulture based in Australia. I started off down in Victoria, grow, helping growers grow avocados in a fairly tough climate and very undesirable with um, very high temperatures and cold winters as well. So nice and challenging. I, before I started my business, I worked as a reseller agronomist, sort of selling chem for sort of things. And I really decided I wanted to get into a bit of a niche and I chose avocados. And the rest is history, really. I moved from Mildura up to Bundaberg, which is up in Queensland. And it's a, a lot more desirable avocado growing area. And there's a lot more avocado growers. So that's. Hi, my name is Lisa Fife. I am the founder and director of an independent agronomy consulting business called Ripe Horticulture based in Australia. I started off down in Victoria, grow, helping growers grow avocados in a fairly
Hi, my name is Lisa Fife. I am the founder and director of an independent agronomy consulting business called Ripe Horticulture based in Australia. I started off down in Victoria, grow, helping growers grow avocados in a fairly tough climate and very undesirable with um, very high temperatures and cold winters as well. So nice and challenging. I Before I started my business, I worked as a reseller agronomist, sort of selling chem for sort of things. And I really decided I wanted to get into a bit of a niche and I chose avocados. And the rest is history, really. I moved from Mildura up to Bundaberg, which is up in Queensland. And it's a, a lot more desirable avocado growing area. And there's a lot more avocado growers. So that's been exciting. I've also got my own orchard where we're doing ultra high density. So that's all. We're doing about 1,111 trees per hectare of Hass and uh, a few other things we're trialing. And that's nice, challenging also. And I've also recently just started a, an online, avocado, the Avocado Academy, where trying to help growers learn a bit more about irrigation and nutrition. Um, so the reasoning because of that is I've spent the last sort of 17 years really focusing on irrigation and nutrition of avocados and uh, there's there's a lot of ways to do it <laughs> and there's a lot of ways of not to do it. So uh, I think that I learned most of that probably growing down in Muldura just due to the extremes and having to get it right. Uh, and that made the biggest difference. And so that's where I got to learn all about the heat mitigation in avocados and predominantly that region. So we call it tri-state. Uh, that's where that's where it all happens. Uh, we've, Simon Newitt and I have got together to compare notes on this. And uh, even though I'm presenting it, Simon is our extension officer for for avocados in Australia and he is also based up in Queensland on the Sunshine Coast. So yeah, massive thank you to having me and it's pretty exciting to be involved and I will forge ahead and talk to you about what we're doing in the region. So just a small little backstory where you can see the location of Tri-State. It's sort of, it's called Tri-State because it's three states that all join together. Uh, you've got sort of the bottom of New South Wales, the top corner of Victoria and the, the east of South Australia. Uh, the Murray River runs through that and that's where all the water comes from. There, there is a lot of water available and there's been some fantastic infrastructure put in to, uh, to, for growers to be able to get that water it just costs a fair bit of money to get that water so the region has sandy sandy type soils with high ph and low organic matter so lucky to have 0.5 and i think if you work really hard on it for about 10 to 15 years you might get to 0.9 um so yeah that makes water retention nutrient retention pretty difficult really hot summers also get the cold winters setup costs are high if you want if you do it properly compared to say the other growing locations that are more ideal for avocados there's low humidity low rainfall sort of average of that 200 mils per year mostly over winter and high winds the reason we have growing avocados in this region historically was due to having a bit of an economic advantage. So it was a bit of a, a time slot of when we harvest, which is that late September through October, November. And it was a bit of a gap in the Australian market. So there was always pretty good prices for avocados. However, that is 
been changing over the last 10 years as Western Australia, over on the other side of the country, they, most of their production is done in the southwest corner. However, their production areas are moving north. And so timelines are starting to overlap. And it's a much more desirable climate over on the Western Australia side than where we're growing. So uh, we will see how the region continues because once it gets too expensive um, and not being cost competitive, or it, it's just all a bit too hard. Also, you're in competition with table grapes, a very, very large table grape growing region, and it's, it's sort of perfect for table grapes. So that's, um, you're competing for land prices for that also. So some of the impacts in the field that we see due to this climate, um, the, the high heat, low humidity, it really reduces our yield. So we, we see huge reduction in fruit size and also a reduction in the fruit number per tree. Um, they're sort of the, the straight up impacts and then you, when you get a little bit more into it, there's that reduction in pollination, the flower stamens dry out, pollen viability reduces. Uh, so re I recently had a presentation with a man called David Lyle who has some technology called BDAR and they're actually able to track honeybee activity. Um, they track the frequency of honeybees and they're able to map your farm uh, and they do that three times a day and they'll do that for three days in a row to give you a bit of a hive map location. And they've found when they're mapping in that region uh, at 34 degrees, bees are off. They go straight to water. So they stop, stop working and then go and start collecting water and then take it back to the hive. And the whole lot of them do that at the same time. So that's pretty interesting information. We also see a fair bit of root death in that top 10 centimetres if, if the growers don't have correct mulching levels. And we, from all of that, we see reduced tree health. Go. So current strategies that we employ in the region are overhead misting systems and they're probably the biggest game changer. They have, they modify the environment, they increase the humidity and they take that temperature down. So you can be standing there, it's a pretty dramatic change. It's four to six degrees, sometimes even up to eight uh, reduction. And um, it's sort of, all depends on your water availability and system and irrigation type on what type of overhead system you put in place. So we've got anything from misting systems to sort of a larger droplet size, um, they call them big knockers. So 240 litre per hour down to 90 litres per hour in the more of the misting system. So, um, the reason why you would put one system in over the other primarily comes down to the amount of water you have in your submains, how big your pumps are and your pipes, and what irrigation system you're on. So on the Murray River, we have pump on the river situation. So a grower just sucks directly out of the river or they're within sort of the more around the towns, there are pressurized irrigation systems, which are fantastic. However, for avocados, we have historically recommended that a pump on the river system is the only way to actually guarantee water on those hot days, unless you have the ability to put a dam in and that dam has to be able to hold at least two days of water for your overhead misting systems. So the reason for this is the pressurized schemes uh, you have to order the water and you're at the peak time, especially around flowering, early fruit set, November, you're up against table grapes and the table grapes also use overhead misting around here. Uh, so 
yeah, you have to be pretty good and that on your computer system, computer ordering system and that might mean sitting on the internet at 3 a.m. in the morning just trying to pick up spare bits of water to be able to uh, use your overhead misters. So it's not desirable. However, it can be done. So all of that will determine how much water you can put out over the top. And then also another definition of, not definition, but another determining factor is whether you're running low level sprinklers or drips underneath on the ground. So currently we also use cover crops to reduce temperature in our mid rows. Um, This really does help. We try to use a bit of a mixed cropping situation. So we want to be having, we want to be promoting beneficial insects. So we need flowering plants. We want to be promoting legume type plants to produce nitrogen and and grasses as well. So we need to mulch the trees as well. Keep the roots cool. We also paint the stems of the plants at planting and also at pruning and when we plant young trees we put a permanent well a a shade mesh around each individual tree and this helps for frost and also sunburn and um, we also use sort of anti-transparent sprays and these kaolinite clay protectants on top of that so you can see that image over on the left it is one tree that had dropped a whole lot of fruit Um, that was almost 50% of the crop fell so I can't recall the exact number of fruit that were on there but it was pretty uh, it's pretty sad for the grower and that was after some pretty vicious heats I think it was two two weeks possibly three weeks of over 40 in a row and it's just it was just too much and they had they had low level misters low level sprinklers and overhead misting so you can see yeah some of these images we've got the mulch the thicker the better in this region Uh, by adding all this additional moisture you usually find that won't last even eight nine months So annual applications are very, very important. Try to use whatever we can get our hands on. There's a lot of, the the image there is actually rice straw. So we use that, we use wood chips. We've tried almond kernels, not good. And yeah, a lot of composts and sort of wood chips and grass hay. Straw, wheat straw, that sort of thing. So, um, or pea straw as well. So some of the benefits that we see from using, doing all of that is increased fruit retention and fruit yield. We see a big increase in fruit size and we see an increase in tree health. We get less sunburn, we have healthier root systems. We generally don't get any roots growing outside the tree mound or, um, just it just gets a little bit too hot even with the cover crops we get increased growth rates as well and we're getting yields coming in earlier on younger trees so sort of two and a half to three years which is what we see up in the subtropics however usually down there it's a four-year guarantee uh, but we're able to improve that there With all of this, there isn't really a lot of recorded scientific data um, done with replicates and controls. It's it's been a lot of in-field practical trials carried out to see a lot of this stuff. And it's really just growers willing to have a go and see and me trying to even just push for a control at least (laughs) rather than do the whole system in one go. And... um, in some of the overhead trials we did overhead misting trials there was a 90 percent fruit drop in the control with no overheads versus a 50 percent fruit drop with overheads on similar age trees same root stock similar nutrition irrigation 
Um, and so that was 14 days over 40 degrees in a row. So that was pretty extreme also, but that's also a very common occurrence in this region. So, and then over those same, that same time period, there was, there's still people that try to grow them without overhead misters. They pretty much lost their entire crop for that season. So, um, I was sort of talking about before the overhead misters and whether you have drips or micro sprinklers underneath, low level sprinklers we call them. If we're using drips and overheads, we, used to, we have to have a bigger droplet size and that's really just to counteract that loss of the evaporative cooling that can come from using those lower level sprinklers. And you usually have to use, uh, run them for a little bit longer as well. It does make trying to grow a cover crop a lot harder just because you have to be really strategic to get a successful cover crop growing and maintain it. So our average rainfall usually occurs over winter. So we're usually using autumn to sow a crop and then we would put the overheads on at night. So run them for eight hours at night time. At that time of the year, there's not a lot of com competition. So it's easy to get water, it's easy to manage. And if you can time it with rain, fantastic, but that it makes it really hard in that low rainfall to manage anything that way. So that's how we use them. And um, also sort of do that for really hot days coming up. You sort of try and wet up the soil. We really need these cover crops just to help reduce that radiation from bare soil. It helps manage weed growth as well, provides beneficial insect populations. So if you, um, even if you have cover crops and then your headlands or your tractor rows are bare, then you can get that radiation burn just off the soil reflecting onto the lower leaves and they just burn the leaves. It's pretty hot. So when we're using micro sprinklers, we usually stick to more of a misting system over the top. And you really do have to reduce that droplet size or you end up putting out too much water. Uh, makes it a lot easier to grow a cover crop. However, you still have to use the low levels that shoot out into the row rather than just stay under the tree to achieve that. So you have to sort of be a bit careful with that one. A lot easier to develop iron deficiency when managed poorly and we find that a lot when you get especially when you have your three weeks of hot weather um, say they're turning them on at 34 degrees a lot of guys are just turning it on and leaving it and then they'll still just run it an irrigation system or an irrigation underneath and if the trees shut down they're really not requiring in some situations and over the, the supplementary days, they may not need as much water. And you can see it on the soil moisture graphs that the water actually increases even though the trees shut down. So all of a sudden you start seeing iron deficiency because you've, you've, it's too wet underneath, but you have to keep putting the overhead misters on. But um, yeah, so there's a bit of a struggle in understanding all of that and, and carrying it out. Uh, to avoid the iron deficiency. The biggest, um, the most obvious time that sort of uh, shows you this is when you don't get the hot weather. So if you don't have, we had one year recently where we didn't have to turn the overhead misters on for three weeks in a row and iron deficiency at that time of the year was just wasn't even present. It was fantastic. And also then going into the, as the Soil temperature starts to cool down. We didn't have an iron problem. And because we're looking at high soil pH, it, it is a big thing if you mismanage your water. So some of the issues with the current strategy is just this cost of setup. Um, like 
the other the other regions that are growing in a nicer climate they just don't have to use these overhead misting they don't have to use frost fans so you're in competition with that also the environment even with this environmental manipulation or heat mitigation we're not getting the same yields per hectare so probably looking on average i think three to five ton a hectare less so um yeah the cost of this setup per tree you're you're definitely up about the 170 dollars a tree at this point in time um, and you need to be also you've got that shade that has to go in around the tree also so that adds adds it in so um, obviously if you're then planting higher densities which is sort of where the, the area is tending to do because the climate lends itself to sort of naturally lower growth rates it makes a lot of sense it uh, doesn't really impact the overhead misting as much because you can, um, you're sort of looking at a almost a whole whole soil coverage situation there. So they, they'll slot in wherever. Uh, however, you know, with the if you're doing low level sprinklers, etc., there's more of those and uh, all the things that come with that. So I guess the other thing we're finding like as a benefit you get fruit coming in earlier but as a negative you're getting trees growing more per season so therefore we need to increase um, growth regulant applications pay a bit more attention to those sort of things um, and obviously the trees are growing more so canopy management needs improving it's not sort of it has to be an annual thing you can't get away with it once every two years which some people have um, some of the parameters around that overhead misting I think need a lot of work so just you know currently turn on at 34 and leave it until it stops being 34 I think that needs a lot more work uh, especially when you're getting if you're irrigating underneath as well and just a little bit more strategic so whether you can water it up early in the morning get everything wet and then sort of top up during the day or with low levels and misters or um, yeah just sort of looking at a, a few more best practice ideas would be fabulous to get some research behind that and use sap flow meters to actually measure tree transpiration rates etc um, and there is a lot of talk about pollination and then the use of overhead so you've got some guys saying that overhead misters make the pollen sticky and that bees aren't as attracted to it okay so um, question came up earlier um, uh, should we be doing pulse irrigation where it comes on every 10 minutes? Lisa talked about these Netafim pulse emitters um, where uh, should we be applying water 15 minutes in rotation in, um, in, in an orchard coming back through and irrigating another in another hour for 15 minutes or should it be continuous? Does anyone have experience or an opinion about uh, how the system should be operated? When we, we compare pulse versus uh, non-pulse uh, overhead uh, cooling, we didn't find any significant uh, differences between those two types. It's important to mention that uh, it's important to avoid situations that you uh, apply less water they needed. If if there is no uh, a leach of the water from the leaves, you'll have a massive uh, salt accumulation. You must apply more water if you are using low quality water. More water than uh, ev than evaporated. Otherwise, you will have very fast accumulation of uh, salt on the leaves. So, if people are looking to save water, we face in one of our experiments, we face uh, very severe damages 
when we did not apply enough uh, water. The situation was even worse than the trees that did not receive the overhead cooling. <clears throat> so it's, it's important to, to pay attention to this point. So do you think the, the salt accumulation can be reflective and actually reduce transpiration and actually be of value? Or is it only a negative? No, I think in our case, uh, the negative impact is much uh, stronger. Yeah. It, it actually burns the leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Francisco, do you have experience or opinions about pulse versus continuous application? No, but one, one thing that maybe I wanted to, to ask Arnon for, for, for his opinion, because when it comes to low volumes, it can also be applied, for example, for frost control. There's been a lot of talk of using low volume or lower volume frost control system. And, 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 and at the end of the day, it's basically a thermodynamic equation. The, the, the more water you have, the more you can, the energy you will absorb to, 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 um, to evaporate that water. In the case of frost control, the more water you have, the more heat you will liberate to freeze that water. With, with, the, with the frost we had two weeks ago, I don't have real data so far, but I've heard some comments that low volume systems didn't provide the right uh, um, protection. Not just like, like the 30 cubic meter per hectare systems. And we're talking about 1.5. So, so oh, sorry, 15, 15 uh, cubic meters per hectare versus 30. So I would say pro probably regarding uh, heat control, it's probably the same. If you don't have enough water to evapor evaporate, the system will not cool as efficient as when you have a lot of water, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, th I think it's a little bit, uh, Basically, you're right, but I think in, in force control, I've seen similar observation like you've seen, that the damages was uh, in, in the area that they apply, small amount were higher than the control. Mm -hmm. uh, but regarding evapor evapor evaporation of water from the leaf, you have certain surface of the leaf. If, if it's wet and the water evaporates, so you, you're reaching certain threshold that you cannot re have a higher evaporation. If everything is wet, so you yeah. have continuous evaporation and then the system work in maximal capacity. Okay. There is that, no that, point that's, that, that's, more. That, that's your threshold. Yeah, it's that's what I think. And again, and again, we need to make very uh, uh, dis uh, pronounced distinguish between low quality water to uh, yeah. high quality water. If we are working with high quality water, the tolerance of the system, if you apply less or if you apply more, the damages will be nil. If you are using low quality water, you mm -hmm. need to be in the field. You mm -hmm. need to look all the time on the leaves. The response to salinity on the leaf is very, very fast. And if you see that the damages is, is uh, start to be very obvious, you must stop. A grower here mentions they, because of limited water capacity, they pulse for 20 to 30 minutes then switch to another section of the orchard. It takes about an hour to cycle through all the sections to come back and start applying. They see an immediate depression in, in air temperature with that uh, during that period of, of pulsing, but it becomes an issue of you know, management. They, they just don't have the volume to, to do continuous irrigation. This is also the main, one of the main problem in Israel. If we, we ask grower, why do you not apply the system in your orchard? This is one of the main issue because during hot days, they open, all of them open the water for the maximal capacity. Yeah. So from the hydraulic point of view, they cannot add much more water for vapor transfer, for, for cooling, you need a lot of water. And the system cannot deliver such a large amount of water. So this is one of the main limiting factors for using this in a large scale, at least in our condition. Yeah, Lisa Fife mentioned that in Australia, they need a dam, which is a reservoir in Australianese, for uh, holding uh, two days worth of water. So they, 
you know, you've got to have water to make this thing work. Yeah. Yeah. One reason I think we have to look at some of the other tools, to be quite frank, in the interim, perhaps you design your new systems uh, with these dual systems in mind and the capacity to do some of these things. Then we go find the water if we can. <laughs> but uh, that's a big, uh, big problem here in our area of Southern California. Yeah. Capacity and cost. Question comes up, at what temperature do you recommend switching the overhead sprinkler system on? Again, we, we started with the 33 and now we move to 36. So 33 is about uh, uh, 198, something 33 like that. 33 is about 90, right? 90. Thank you. 36 is about 97. And that's pretty common here. We're hitting those 97s pretty easy. One question for, for, for the California growers. When you have these heat waves, uh, do you see any difference in temperature between the higher part of the orchards and the lower parts of the orchards? That it might be a little bit cooler when you go up? Uh, you, you would see that in gullies and in, in your more your micro aspect, but our, our heat events have been wind driven more and more, okay. especially as you get well, towards the like end of the summer. Us. So everything is about the same and okay. it, it really hurts. Um, everywhere um, okay. hotter where it's drier and you have less marine air but uh it it uh it's wind driven from the east okay yeah but what about east west north south on hills well that's what i'm saying there's a lot of difference yeah. between some of your aspects and what side of the hill you're on whether you're facing the sun or, or not so there's a lot of individual difference in in your could be a lot of difference in between uh, one person's location on the same ranch. Yeah. I know one of the things that happens here is it, these heat spells can happen winter, summer, spring, and fall. It's not just a spring phenomenon. And uh, it used to be that we used to get Santa Ana conditions only occurring late fall. And now it's these Santa Anas, which are these dry, dry winds that come from the interior can just pop up any time of the year. And, and they can have significant impacts on, on um, tree productivity. And, and they are very dry uh, humidities. So that's one thing. A water, if you can get it, works really well. Because um, it's kind of getting back to what it would be on a normal day. Like we get these uh, very, very dry humidities. And it may not be blowing a hard wind in the middle of June, July, or, or early bloom and set. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's got that eastern push, and it's just dry, dry air. So the question pops up again and again. Are there any specific strategies to save water with overhead sprinkler systems? <laughs> Let's get down to brass tacks here, guys. Is, is, is it, if you're saving water, are you saving the trees? Are you uh, yeah. saving the trees? Well, it, okay. it is brass tacks, but uh, it comes down to a point where you have to look at the value of your crop, period. And it doesn't matter when it's hot. We know we're in penalty, but we cannot pull off the throttle. And we make that choice every day that we have a, a heat event or in anticipation of a heat event, we do not take our foot off the throttle. Yeah. May cost us, but losing that fruit or the potential of, of letting those trees or fruit wither, if you have an opportunity to do something about it, uh, we generally do. Yeah. You know, the thing to remember is that, you know, Derek was showing, uh, not just fruit damage, but tree damage. You know, you're damaging the bark, you're damaging the branches, you're damaging the future productivity of the orchard. It's not just this year, but you know, you may be knocking out the crop for the following year, but you're also damaging the tree. So there's a really a lot at stake here. So also the use of cover crops, is that competing with bees for pollination? Uh, I think that the cover crops 
in the cooler spring, so the earlier flowering where temperatures are still quite low and your flowers might not open until midday, sometimes two o'clock in the afternoon. If you don't have a cover crop there attracting the bees and the beneficials, they're going to fly off to the competing citrus in the, in the area. So you do have to be a little bit careful there. Um, another issue can be water quality. Generally, if you're pumping out of the Murray River on the Victoria side, you're fine. It's when you cross the border and you go into South Australia and they've uh, just got some different, they're coming out of different lakes and holding lakes and you've got more salt in the water. Uh, they're having a few issues with s sodium pickup and sodium burn in some of their older leaves. So there is, um, they have to be a bit wary of that and also a bit silty as well. So it, it's covering the leaves and um, inhibiting photosynthesis. So water use efficiency, again, in the trees, I think all of this can be improved and I think a lot of people are overdoing it. And the iron deficiency is also a big one that we see. So some of the further work, improve water use efficiency and water productivity. So the yield per hectare per megalitre identifies VPD to optim optimize this system in Australia uses sap flow meters to identify stress and reduction in transpiration. Use that BDAR program that I was talking about to try and highlight uh, just overhead misters and pollination and whether it's inhibiting or improving. Uh, also with the cover crop thing as well, use, I think we need to use or look into more of the newer irrigation technologies so we're, we're actually looking to do a trial up in our region in Bundaberg, which is subtropical, and that's using overhead misters here, um, but ones that can be installed into our existing infrastructure, so we're not having to put additional submains, additional automation, etc. Um, so that's using the newer Netafim pulsing uh, emitter that has like a valve that an independent valve on each overhead and when that builds up pressure it releases water so it's it's not impacting your flow rates as much so that should be interesting to see how that goes but even just with the thermal imaging as well like I've seen a bit of that in macadamias and that's pretty impressive stuff just seeing helping to find block sprinklers as well but um, just how well it cools down the vegetation. And uh, you can see in one of those images at the top, the red is, is hotter, the hotter color. And you can sort of see where there's a blocked sprinkler. So the, the trees are all in red. And then you can see where the water's going on the low levels. And you can see a, a gap, basically. And so there's all this information happening and out there and it'd be great to get a little bit more of that in avocados on large scale sort of orchards in conjunction with overhead misters to, to actually see what a control and a trial looks like with different droplet sizes that would be cool so yeah that's it from me thanks for listening uh, if you have any questions or anything, that's my email. Happy to answer anything. Um, yeah, can't wait to see everyone else's presentations at a later date. Thanks again. And thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Simon. Uh, <clears throat> so there were some questions in the chat that came up. Okay. So um, question came up earlier. Um, uh, should we be doing pulse irrigation where it comes on every 10 minutes? Lisa talked about these Netafim pulse emitters um, where uh, should we be applying water 15 minutes in rotation in, um, in, in an orchard coming back through and 
irrigating another in another hour for 15 minutes or should it be continuous? Does anyone have experience or an opinion about uh, how the system should be operated? When we, we compare pulse versus uh, non-pulse uh, overhead uh, cooling, we didn't find any significant uh, differences between those two types. It's important to mention that uh, it's important to avoid situations that you uh, apply less water than needed. If, if there is no uh, a leach of the water from the leaves, you'll have a massive uh, salt accumulation. You must apply more water if you are using low quality water. More water than, uh, ev than evaporated. Otherwise, you will have very fast accumulation of uh, salt on the leaves. So if people are looking to save water, we face in one of our experiments, we face uh, very severe damages when we did not apply enough uh, water. The situation was even worse than the trees that did not receive the overhead cooling. <clears throat> so it's, it's important to, to pay attention to this point. So do you think the, the salt accumulation can be reflective and actually reduce transpiration? and actually be of value, or is it only a negative? No, I think in our case, uh, the negative impact is much uh, stronger. Yeah. It, it actually burns the leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Francisco, do you have experience or opinions about pulse versus continuous application? No, but one, one thing that maybe I wanted to, to ask Arnold for, for, for his opinion, because when it comes to low volumes, it can also be applied, for example, for frost control. There's been a lot of talk of using low volume or lower volume frost control system. And, 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 and at the end of the day, it's basically a thermodynamic equation. The, the, the more water you have, the more you can, the energy you will absorb to, 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 um, to evaporate that water. In the case of frost control, the more water you have, the more heat you will liberate to freeze that water. With, with, the, with the frost we had two weeks ago, I don't have real data so far, but I've heard some comments that low volume systems didn't provide the right uh, um, protection. Not just like, like the 30 cubic meter per hectare systems. And we're talking about 1.5. So, so oh, sorry, 15, 15 uh, cubic meters per hectare versus 30. So I would say pro probably regarding uh, heat control, it's probably the same. If you don't have enough water to evapor evaporate, the system will not cool as efficient as when you have a lot of water, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, th I think it's a little bit, uh, Basically, you're right, but I think in, in frost control, I've seen similar observation like you have seen that the damages was uh, in, in the area that they applied, small amount were higher than the control. Mm -hmm. uh, but regarding evapo evapo evaporation of water from the leaf, you have certain surface of the leaf. If, if it's wet and the water evaporates, so you, you're reaching certain threshold that you cannot re have a higher evaporation. If everything is wet, so you yeah. have continuous evaporation and then the system work in maximal capacity. That's your threshold. Yeah, it's that's what I think. And again, and again, we need to make very uh, uh, dis uh, pronounced distinguish between low quality water to uh, yeah. high quality water. If we are working with high quality water, the tolerance of the system, if you apply less or if you apply more, the damages will be nil. If you are using low quality water, you need to be in the field, you need to look all the time on the leaves. The response to salinity on the leaf is very, very fast. And if you see that the damages is, is uh, start to be very obvious, you must stop. A grower here mentions they, because of limited water capacity, they pulse for 20 to 30 minutes and switch to another section of the orchard 
that takes about an hour to cycle through all the sections to come back and start applying. They see an immediate depression in, in air temperature with that uh, during that period of, of pulsing, but it becomes an issue of you know, management. They, they just don't have the volume to, to do continuous irrigation. This is also the main, one of the main problems in Israel. If we, we ask Grover, why do you not apply the system in your orchard? This is one of the main issues because during hot days, they open, all of them open the water for the maximal capacity. Yeah. So from the hydraulic point of view, they cannot add much more uh, water for uh, vapor transpir- for, for cooling. You need a lot of water. And the system cannot deliver such a large amount of water. So this is one of the main limiting factors for using this in a large scale, at least in our condition. Yeah, Lisa Fife mentioned that in Australia, they need a dam, which is a reservoir in Australianese, for uh, holding uh, two days worth of water. So they, you know, you've got to have water to make this thing work. Yeah. One reason I think we have to look at some of the other tools, to be quite frank, in the interim, perhaps you design your new systems uh, with these dual systems in mind and the capacity to do some of these things. Then we go find the water if we can. <laughs> But uh, that's a big, uh, big problem here in our area of Southern California. Yeah. Capacity and cost. Question comes up, at what temperature do you recommend switching the overhead sprinkler system on? Again, we, we started with the 33 and now we moved to 36. So 33 is about uh, uh, 198, something 33 like that. 33 is about 90, right? 90. Thank you. 36 is about 97. And that's pretty common here. We're hitting those 97s pretty easy. One question for, for, for the California growers. When you have these heat waves, uh, do you see any difference in temperature between the higher part of the orchards and the lower parts of the orchards? That it might be a little bit cooler when you go up? Uh, you, you would see that in gullies and in, in your more your micro aspect, but our Our heat events have been wind driven more and more, okay. especially as you get well, towards the like end of the summer. Fast. So everything is about the same and okay. it, it really hurts um, everywhere. Um, okay. Hotter where it's drier and you have less marine air, but uh, it, it, uh, it's wind driven from the east. Okay. Yeah. But what about east, west, north, south on hills? Well, that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of difference yeah. between some of your aspects and what side of the hill you're on, whether you're facing the sun or, or not. So there's a lot of individual difference in, in your, could be a lot of difference in between uh, one person's location on the same ranch. Yeah. I know and one of the things that happens here is it, these heat spells can happen winter, summer, spring, and fall. It's not just a spring phenomenon. And, uh, It used to be that we used to get Santa Ana conditions only occurring late fall. And now it's these Santa Anas, which are these dry, dry winds that come from the interior can just pop up any time of the year. And, and they can have significant impacts on, on um, tree productivity. And, and they are very dry uh, humidities. So that's one thing. A water, if you can get it, it works really well. Um, because it's kind of getting back to what it would be on a normal day. Like we get these uh, very, very dry humidities, and it may not be blowing a hard wind in the middle of June, July, or, or early bloom and set, yeah. uh, but it's, it's got that eastern push, and it's just dry, dry air. So the question pops up again and again, are there any specific strategies to save water with overhead sprinkler systems? <laughs> Let's get down to brass tacks here, guys. Is it, is it if you're saving water, are you saving the trees? Are you uh, yeah. saving the trees? Well, it, it is brass tacks, but uh, it comes down to a point where you have to look at the value of your crop, period. 
and it doesn't matter when it's hot. We know we're in penalty, but we cannot pull off the throttle. And we make that choice every day that we have a, a heat event or in anticipation of a heat event. We do not take our foot off the throttle. Yeah. May cost us, but losing that fruit or the potential of, of letting those trees or fruit wither, if you have an opportunity to do something about it, uh, we generally do. Yeah. You know, the thing to remember is that, you know, Derek was showing uh, not just fruit damage, but tree damage. You know, you're damaging the bark, you're damaging the branches, you're damaging the future productivity of the orchard. It's not just this year, but, you know, you may be knocking out the crop for the following year, but you're also damaging the tree. So there's a, really a lot at stake here. I would like to, to mention another uh, strategy that can a little bit reduce the damage. At least in our situation, we see that the severity of the damages when we have very strong heat wave is mainly on the border of the, of mm. the orchard. So if we have a windbreak, a tree or other system to, to stop the wind, I think it would uh, reduce uh, the damages because uh, the area can uh, maintain higher humidity yeah. and the speed of the dry wind will be reduced. Yeah, excellent, excellent. You know, it, it really sounds like a combination. You know, it's whitewash, it's, it's irrigation, it's maybe something like resist, and then these cover crops and mulch and, and a windbreak. We've cut down all our windbreaks here, you know, because we wanted to plant more avocados. And it well, may be. So that, not, not only that, but uh, they're really Roman candles in a, a, a fire event in Southern yeah, California. Yeah. But uh, that, that exactly is what we're saying. Different parts of the grove uh, uh, react differently uh, to these events, for sure. So here's a question from Greg Alder. Arnon, running drip irrigation under the trees during heat waves. How often do you run? So does drip irrigation have any impact on heat mitigation? The, the standard practice in the orchard in Israel during heat wave, all the growers open the water all the time long. Yeah. They do not stop irrigate. You got to keep the tree transpiring, right? Yeah. The impact on the temperature of the environment is, is not so, uh, so big because, again, the water are penetrating into the soil and there is a very low amount of uh, evaporation of water. So regarding cooling impact, I don't know whether it's impact. If we are using sprinklers, probably you have a better impact. And if you are doing your sprinkler in the middle of the canopy, it will be even better. Uh, but in, in Israel, everybody is using nowadays in avocados, they are using only drip irrigation. So this is what we have. So Francisco pointed out, I mean, when the tree shuts down, it's not transpiring, it heats up. You got to get the water into the tree before the heat spell. You got to get it hydrated so it will maintain its stomata open so it can continue transpiring. So you really have to have a good irrigation practice in place before you um, run into the heat spell. Yeah, but, but I think that also at some point, the the the, the, the closure of the stomata will be driven by temperature. Yeah, yeah. So, so at some point you can have all the water you want in the soil, but the trees just won't take it. Yeah. Yeah, once they shut down, they shut down. So somebody says, I'm, I was late to attend. Were the, was there any discussion about how overhead irrigation can possibly increase pollination rates through increased humidity in the grove during critical time frames? Um, so. I don't think that uh, if you apply water on the canopy, it's, uh, the bee will not work. If it's too uh, hot, they're not working. No, I think be, uh, they cannot work under uh, water. Oh, if you oh, have uh, mist too. or if you have uh, water applied, they will not work. So I, I don't think it's, this combination is, is very efficient. The, the other question I have, uh, probably maybe, maybe Arnon, you can also help me. Uh, one, one of the comments was that um, there was an issue with drop size. 
And but but I believe if drops are on the other hand are too big, they will fall off from the leaves a lot easier than if they're not that big. So at some point there, there, there has to be a balance between it. it's not that small, so it doesn't evaporate while it's falling, but at some point also it doesn't have to fall very, very easily from the leaves. It's a good point. I think we, if we continue this study, we need to, to optimize the drop, uh, drop size. So um, one last question. How many emitters per tree do Israeli growers use? How many dripper emitters? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the, some, of the growers, <laughs> some of the growers using uh, two lines, some of them using uh, one line. Generally, the uh, discharge rate is around 1.5 liter per hour. And the distance, if I remember well, is generally around one meter, one between the other. Okay, with that, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I'm sure there's still a lot of questions out there, but uh, there's a lot of questions that we need answered before we you know, can make the answers. I think Lisa made a long list of questions that we need to address before we can say definitively what we need to do to mitigate heat. But I know a healthy tree is better able to sustain it. A good irrigation system is better able to maintain a healthy tree. And we need to start thinking about overhead irrigation, so. Thank you very much. You know, one, thing, one, thing that, one thing that maybe I can add to, to what you said, Ben, and, and at the end of the day, that's something that, that we haven't discussed and probably doesn't come directly when we discuss this issue is how we make our root system be the best root system we can have to have the better tree. That's, that's probably a big part of the equation that we need to focus to, 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 to address all stress situations, yeah. all of them, frost, heat, whatever. Yeah. A healthy tree is going to resist better. A healthy root system makes a healthy tree. Yeah, good point. Okay, you can all go back to work now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much.